ago, cases of COVID-19 began rapidly rippling out across the planet, infecting millions and crippling the global economy. Now that we've made it through the winter of 2023 without a significant surge in cases, Americans are breathing a little bit easier and the ailing economy is gradually improving. Tonight, we'll discuss when we may actually be able to declare victory over COVID. And in the wake of a pandemic-induced health labor shortage, we're going to talk about what the developing crisis could mean for the future of health care. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us tonight, as always, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And later on tonight, our special guest is Jeremy Nordquist, who serves as the president of the Nebraska Hospital Association. He's an influential advocate in health care and a driver in hospital quality and safety improvement. And he's giving us some of his very valuable time. Dr. Gold, thank you so much for joining us. You've been here for us throughout the last three years. What are you tracking for our viewers this evening? Well, thank you very much, Christina. It is always a great pleasure to be with you and be with the audience on Monday nights. And uh, let me just start off by saying I uh, recently became aware of yet another school shooting, this time uh, in Nashville with the loss of life and our thoughts and prayers certainly go to all the families and friends, colleagues, teachers, staff, and the whole communities uh, that are affected by this. Every time we hear about another one of these events, it just saddens us uh, uh, oh so terribly greatly. But let's get a look at the graphics, talk a bit about COVID, and then a couple of other items that I do want to bring to our attention tonight of some recently breaking news. I had much to talk about with uh, Mr. Norquist in just a few minutes. When we look at the global uh, COVID case map, almost no change from previous weeks. Very low numbers, still a bit more uh, through parts of the southern tip of South America, a uh, bit across uh, the U.S., uh, a little bit in Eastern Europe. But for the most part, the global numbers uh, just continue uh, to fall. And this is uh, substantiated by the fact that we're under one per 100,000 on both cases and deaths uh, over the last 14 days. And again, total case count, just uh, under 21,000 uh, total death rate, uh, just under 269. Uh, again, uh, hard to know how reliable these numbers are, but the trends uh, are very, very significant and all uh, fortunately moving in the right direction to your earlier point of trying to put this in the rearview mirror. When we look at what's going on across the United States, again, a pretty favorable map. We're still seeing a bit of uh, activity in North and South Dakota, uh, still parts of Alaska, a uh, little bit in, in areas of uh, Nevada. Interestingly, Louisiana has uh, perked up a bit, uh, but the rest of the country uh, is continuing to see uh, an ever declining number of cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. Indeed, uh, just under 20,000 confirmed hospitalizations uh, in the U.S., or six per 100,000 per day. That's 34% down over the last 14-day period. Again, not terribly reliably reported anymore, but the trend analysis is moving in the right direction. Hospitalization, which we'll talk a bit more about with uh, Mr. Norquist in a few minutes, uh, just over 22,000. Again, down 14% uh, in the last two weeks. And that's also true about a continued reduction in the number of patients in ICUs and the reported uh, death rates uh, in the U.S. If we look at it by state, uh, as I said a few minutes ago, we're at about six per 100,000 cases the uh, uh, last 24 hours, uh, 19,000 confirmed cases. Uh, but... Louisiana, my home state here in Nebraska, <clears throat> South Dakota, Wisconsin, Illinois, anywhere between about one and a half and twice uh, the U.S. average. So a much tighter range uh, on the state-by-state -state basis. If we look at it across the smaller uh, rural communities, whether it's in North Dakota, Wisconsin, uh, Louisiana, as we mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, we're anywhere from about six to nine times uh, the U.S. average uh, of six per 100,000 uh, per day. 
You know, I'm sure our audience remembers times that we were 60 to 90 to 100 times the U.S. average in some of the small rural farming and ranching communities. So this is also, while there's still a good deal of variability here due to small numbers, this is still a very, very significant and very favorable change in the reported uh, case counts. When we look at the U.S. wastewater numbers, again, it is all favorable, showing uh, even in the highest wastewater levels of 80 to 100 percent of uh, viral counts and even 60 to 70 percent viral counts, uh, we're collectively down over 30 percent uh, in that category. And that's with uh, over 1,450 sampling sites uh, reporting. If you look at the map, there are still hot spots, and you can see some uh, in our home state here in Nebraska, some in the Bay Area in California. Again, the Great Lakes region still seems to have some. And if you look at the uh, Vermont uh, and southern Maine area of the country, we can see some uh, amber and bright red. But for the most part, we're in the blue-gray regions uh, of the country, uh, which is very, very favorable for falling uh, wastewater levels, which are pretty good predictors of the two to three week uh, case loads and hospitalization loads ahead. As has been the case for a long time now, uh, the XBB 1.5 variant is uh, the most prominent variant in the United States. Uh, it is over 90% of cases uh, based upon the NowCast models. However, I would like to point out to our audience tonight that there's a new player on this list that is continuing to rise in prevalence, and that's a newer strain of XBB. It's called uh, 1.9.1. You can see it up there in the chart as the second most prominent uh, subtype of the Omicron variants. It's at about 2.5%, but it's been rising rapidly. It's the most recently detected variant. Uh, we've seen it in parts of Western Europe, the Middle East, uh, South America, etc. And the predictions are that this is going to likely outcompete the 1.5. And whether that will cause a surge in case numbers or hospitalizations remains to be seen. It does not appear to be any more uh, severe in terms of the illness, but it does appear to have a competitive advantage uh, compared to the 1.5. So that's something that we'll watch with you, our audience, uh, very closely uh, as we uh, continue to move ahead over the upcoming weeks. If we look at the distribution across the United States, you can see uh, that the uh, uh, 1.5 is prominent in almost every community. But if you look at the slivers of the very dark blue, you're seeing this newer uh, 1.9.1 uh, subtype start to appear particularly in the coastal regions, particularly in the northeast, mid-Atlantic, and southeast. Very little of it uh, is seen in the central or western parts of the country just yet. So, and as I said, we will keep a very close eye on this subtype uh, as it may outcompete uh, what we thought was the time that we're going to be putting this in the rearview mirror. Uh, as I said earlier, when we look at hospitalization rate and ICU uh, hospitalization, the trends continue to be favorable with continuing falling numbers. These are the most reliable data points that we have. And again, uh, although a uh, slower fall than we would like to see, uh, the numbers are moving in the right direction. A lot of this has to do with greater levels of immunity and the use of uh, antiviral agents, uh, particularly in higher risk, older patients, patients with weakened immune systems and other comorbidities. If you look at the hospitalization rates by state, uh, you can see uh, U.S. average, as we said earlier, about seven per 100,000. Uh, but Delaware, North Carolina, Maine, Missouri, and our nation's capital, Washington, D.C., are roughly anywhere from uh, one and a half to roughly two and a half times uh, the U.S. average. There's more variability in the small rural farming and ranching communities, but even the range of hospitalization uh, has fallen considerably, which again is a very, very favorable trend that we monitor with you week to week. And finally, when we look at the COVID death rates, they too continue to fall. There is some variability in this reporting just due to the fact that they tend to be recorded and then reported in batches. And so it causes these little uh, peaks and valleys. But overall, 
uh, the death rate numbers, the case fatality numbers are falling. The U.S. Uh, average over the last 14 days is 0 0.8 per 100,000. Uh, Montana, Kentucky, Arkansas, Vermont, uh, Idaho, uh, one and a half to uh, three and a half times that roughly. But again, a lot of this is small numbers. You can see uh, the average death rates, uh, Montana 3, in Kentucky 8.9, and Arkansas 5. So these are very small numbers, which gives us tremendous amount of variability uh, in the per 100,000 uh, reporting. Overall, uh, these trends do appear uh, to be moving in a favorable direction. If you look at the overall death rates due to viral pneumonia, influenza, COVID, uh, all of what we call the ILIs, the influenza-like illnesses, uh, updated uh, through March 23rd, uh, which would be, you know, approximately a few days ago, uh, end of last week. Uh, you can see uh, we've still continued to fall, although it almost looks like we're in a plateau stage right now. And given the fact that influenza uh, and COVID deaths are falling. Uh, we wonder whether there are other viral agents, uh, such as the rotaviruses and others that we've been seeing uh, fill some of our hospital beds. We've not quite gotten down to that wavy black line baseline, which is the annual trend that we've come to expect, uh, you know, for literally decades of what uh, influenza and other viral uh, pneumonia deaths uh, have been uh, in the United States. So that distance between the red line and the wavy black line, <clears throat> excuse me, is what we are following most carefully. Uh, no change in vaccination status uh, in our country. Uh, so just keep showing this to you, hoping it'll go up uh, someday. But the boosting rate remains uh, approximately half of what those have been vaccinated. And almost all the boosting now that's ongoing is actually occurring in the older age and most vulnerable uh, population. So this is a couple of graphics that I wanted to share that look at maternal vaccination rates as a function of infant COVID hospitalization. And this is a fairly large cohort of about 500 moms uh, who were vaccinated and 500 moms who were not vaccinated and the number of infants <clears throat> that were hospitalized. So this is serious illness uh, in infants that are approximately two months of age. And so if you look at uh, ICU rates, if you look at those that need uh, critical care, if you look at those that need invasive monitoring, uh, you can see that the trend uh, in the darker colors are those born to moms that were not vaccinated. And uh, <clears throat> in the lighter colors are those that are born to moms uh, that were fully vaccinated. If you look at the comparison of these two groups, uh, you can see that there are approximately 500 infants in both groups, average age, two months. Uh, if you look at the gender, that's about 44% uh, female infants, about a uh, little over 50% uh, uh, male infants. If you look at the breakdown by race and ethnicity, uh, you can clearly see uh, that these are very, very similar groups. And yet when you look at the outcomes, it's very clear there's a 50% vaccine efficacy uh, in these newborns. Now understand, none of these newborns are vaccinated because they're too young to be eligible to be vaccinated. So this is purely based on the vaccine status of the mom. But if you look at those that were vaccinated during the second half of the pregnancy, you're looking at vaccine effectiveness in the newborn of preventing serious illness, preventing COVID hospitalization in the two-month-olds of about 75%. And indeed, if you look at the prevention of ICU care, that is to say super serious illness requiring invasive monitoring or requiring uh, placing on a ventilator, you're looking at even higher levels of vaccine efficacy. So yet one more time, very conclusive data 
uh, that vaccination uh, during the latter half of pregnancy not only prevents COVID in the newborns, but prevents serious illness and hospitalization and indeed uh, absolutely uh, saves lives. And then finally, uh, before we start to take our audience questions, this was a well done, fairly large study uh, that was funded by the National Institutes of Health that looked at a very, very important question, which has to do with the number and function of T cells. Now, T cells are part of our immune system, and they are the cells that are responsible for our long-term immunity. That is to say, when we're vaccinated for measles or mumps, when we're vaccinated for shingles, when we're vaccinated uh, for, uh, with Pneumovax for uh, bacterial pneumonia, it is our T cells that remember the fact that we've seen these infections and that we can mount an immune response to them. And then the B cells, the other immune cells, tend to manufacture the antibodies based upon this amnestic response. And the CD8 T cells are a very important part of our response. So what these authors did was they compared uh, CD8 T cell uh, function in individuals uh, who were unexposed, uh, who received uh, 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 unexposed subjects who had never received uh, the vaccines, unexposed subjects who received the vaccines but never were infected, and then those that were infected uh, and, uh, and vaccinated. And the message here that's very important is that those that were uh, unexposed <clears throat> and uh, received the vaccine, seen in blue, you can see that they had good T cell numbers and good T cell function. Those that were uh, infected from COVID recovered and then were vaccinated had very good T cell function, uh, seen in gray uh, with the black line. But those individuals who were infected and not vaccinated had long-standing fall off in T cell number and T cell function. Now our T cells, particularly our CD8 T cells, are very important in allowing us to fight off many different types of infection, uh, not just SARS-CoV-2. And this, uh, again, makes the point that uh, one of the longer lasting effects uh, of SARS-CoV-2, uh, COVID uh, infection, is a specific loss of function of these T cells. Now, how long this will last, what the implications will be for subsequent infection remains to be seen. But there is also little question based on this excellent study that the T cell function uh, is significantly enhanced uh, by the use of the vaccines. And so that's the last graphic that I wanted to share tonight, Christina. I very, very much look forward uh, to answering our audience's questions and hearing from them. And in just a few minutes to uh, introduce uh, Mr. Norquest into our conversation. Absolutely. We have so much to talk about tonight, Dr. Gold. And let's go ahead and get that number up on the screen. After all, you are a huge part of the show. We want to hear from you tonight. 877-731-6733 is the number to call. And Dr. Gold, before we go to the phones, I do want to talk a little bit about this looming deadline six weeks from now, a little bit more than six weeks from now on May 11th. The U.S. will end its national and public health emergency declarations over COVID-19, marking an official end to the country's sweeping pandemic response. Now, one of the biggest changes is that some of the data that we've been that we've had access to giving us those case numbers. It sounds like we might not be able to access as much data. I wonder what that means. If you think that this is happening at the right time or if it's a little bit premature from your perspective, what do you think? Well, in terms of having access to national, regional, and local data, uh, this is something that we need constantly. And I think even if we don't have it aggregated on the national level by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, uh, we need to have it available to us on the state level, and we need to have it available to us on the local and regional level, because that's where we really have to deal with it. You know, as we've said repetitively on our broadcast, particularly in the smaller rural farming and ranching communities, uh, all health care is local, and certainly these infections, and, and not just COVID infections, but all of these infections are local. 
The other point is that as we are getting further and further away from the uh, initial use of the bivalent vaccine, and we know that our immune levels will fall over time, and we're seeing these new subtypes of the SARS-CoV-2 variant become a, you know, more widely progressive and transmitted across the United States. I would say the next six weeks are going to be absolutely critical from a data perspective. But as our audience may know, there are other very significant changes that will also occur on May 11th, uh, which have to do uh, with access to health care, uh, which have to do with the use of telehealth services, uh, and actually will have to do with the cost of testing, uh, vaccination, and treatment antivirals uh, that uh, are available. I mean, right now the vaccines are free. So I guess one of the messages to our audience tonight is if you or one of your loved ones or friends is on the fence about getting vaccinated in the next couple of weeks to months, uh, if you want to do it and not pay for it, uh, show up at your local pharmacy before May 11th or, uh, or you're going to be paying for it. We'll see if that boosts demand at all, Dr. Gold, when that happens. You know, sometimes you push a pocketbook and it makes a big difference. A lot of times it's the pocketbook that will move people. So we'll find out what happens there. I do want to ask you this. We have been seeing a lot more research coming out about post-COVID and brain fog in particular. Have we learned anything new over the past several weeks about post-COVID, the symptoms, how long they last? Anything new there? Well, you know, we were privileged to uh, have Dr. Anderson several weeks ago, and we talked about the cardiovascular symptoms and the neurologic symptoms. Uh, unfortunately, we're still seeing a good deal of it. You know, I was just looking at some of the return to work statistics, uh, not just in our state, but nationally, and the number of uh, what we call FMLA uh, leaves, uh, which our people are taking uh, due to family medical problems either for themselves or one of their immediate family members, uh, continue to be higher now than they actually were in the immediate post-Omicron uh, phase, you know, that we were talking about a year ago. Uh, they're actually at almost an all-time high uh, for individuals that are losing work time, which is critically important for them because many are maxing out on their benefits but critically important for hospitals and schools and so many other parts of our economy and our society that, uh, that we depend upon these individuals for. And if they're out due to cardiovascular problems or renal problems or brain fog, uh, they're just not where we need them uh, to help care for others, educate our kiddos, you know, work in our restaurants uh, and so many other critically important areas on our farms and ranches. In terms of the etiology of this, a lot remains to be seen, but it is currently thought to be an immune function. That is to say, it keys up our immune system, uh, which causes some what are referred to as microvascular or changes in the very, very small blood vessels in our brain and in our nerves, uh, which then results uh, in this uh, brain fog. I mean, it is theoretically uh, completely reversible, but we have seen individuals that have gone on for weeks, months, and actually uh, up to two years uh, with it. And so it's uh, unclear as to what differentiates individuals that have several weeks of brain fog and then they return to, you know, quote, normal, unquote, although who knows what that really means, uh, or to those that are, you know, what I would call more chronically disabled. That is to say, it's lasted over a year, 18 months, uh, up to two years. You know, I'll do a deeper dive into this, and hopefully uh, when we're together again next week, uh, I can provide a little bit more depth on if there's anything new uh, in the research on brain fog. Thank you so much, Dr. Gold. We always appreciate how you take it an extra step further every time someone has a question. You will individually go out just for that person to make sure they get the answer. I really appreciate that. Jimmy from South Carolina joins us. Jimmy, thanks for joining us tonight. Go right ahead. Well, first off, I'd like to thank Dr. Gold for all the information he's given us over the months to be a reliable source of information, somebody we can depend on. But my question thank is, uh, me and my wife are both in our 80s. We both have health issues. Uh, she's diabetic, and I, I'm, uh, I have congestive heart failure. 
And we've been fully vaccinated and have received the three boosters. Our last booster shot was in September. And I'm wondering if we need to have another booster. I, I asked our, my doctor about that, and he didn't give me a, a very good answer on it. And I was sort of disappointed in what he said, but I would like to ask Dr. Goldblatt. Well, appreciate the question, Jimmy, and I really, really appreciate your kind words about the show, and it is truly a pleasure and an honor to join our audience uh, weekly uh, and try to provide uh, useful, uh, transparent information. Uh, in answer to your question, uh, the answer is a bit complex, I'm afraid, in that the uh, uh, CDC, the Food and Drug Administration, and the ACIP, the uh, antimicrobial uh, uh, committees that render judgments on these things have not re, have not gotten to a final point of recommending another bivalent booster at this time. Now there are parts of Europe, uh, Western Europe, that have recommended a second bivalent booster at the six month point. And what the CDC and the FDA are considering right now, and I was on a a uh, a panel discussion on this just last week, as a matter of fact, in our nation's capital, uh, is the wisdom of recommending uh, a six-month boost with the bivalent booster now versus uh, a boost in the fall that would be combined with uh, influenza vaccine, with flu vaccine. You know, as I like to tell all of our callers that healthcare is local and the judgment of your healthcare professional uh, whoever's treating your congestive heart failure or your wife's diabetes would be in the best position to advise you on what to do. I do know that there are a good number of senior citizens, particularly those with multiple medical risk factors, who have actually gone on on, on their own to show up at their local pharmacy or be recommended uh, to get another boost uh, because they're at higher risk uh, from their primary care. Uh, settings, uh, whether it's a clinic or a hospital or an outpatient uh, uh, center, uh, etc. But a lot of that depends on age and depends on, uh, on comorbidity. Uh, the, uh, the Centers for Disease Control and the Food and Drug Administration are going to be meeting again within the next several weeks, and it's my understanding that they're going to continue to address this. But as the pages fall off the calendar, I think the likelihood is going to get less and less. And, you know, some of this is not about whether another boost would actually increase uh, your immunity and prevent serious illness uh, due to COVID. Uh, it's about what is the message we really want to send to the American people who have been so booster resistant, uh, I and mean, for that matter, even vaccine resistant, over the last several years. You know, it's been approximately two years now since the vaccines first came out. We've really not been able to move the curve on boosters very much, particularly in the younger uh, population where the risk is actually the highest of transmitting the disease. Uh, we've been much more successful uh, in the older population. And some of the thinking goes along the lines is that if you combine it with flu vaccine, you may have a higher chance of being successful. So my best advice is uh, chat with your doc uh, who or whoever provides your care uh, and, uh, and see uh, what their recommendations are. Excellent. Thank you so much for joining us, Jimmy. And thank you to you and your wife for being here with us every Monday night. All right, Brenda from Nevada, we're going to go to you on the other side of this break. We thank you for your patience. Stay with us. I want to give you an opportunity to call in as well. 877-731-6733. It's a good time to call in right now as we go to commercial break. And when we come back, Jeremy Nordquist will join our conversation. We're talking about the nation's hurting hospitals and what it means for the future after this quick break. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And now we welcome Mr. Jeremy Nordquist. A little background about Mr. Nordquist. He serves as president of the Nebraska Hospital Association, which represents Nebraska hospitals as a trusted voice and influential advocate in health care, also a driver of hospital quality and safety improvement. 
Now, Mr. Nordquist has also served his time in politics. He served as a Nebraska state senator, chief of staff for two U.S. congressmen, state legislative staff, and as a nonprofit leader, he previously served as government affairs director for Nebraska Medics Medicine and a regional health network, UNMC's primary clinical partner. So we welcome you. I, I love it when government and medicine come together and you are the bridge for us tonight, sir. We appreciate having you on. Now, in a recent tweet, the Nebraska Hospital Association said hospitals across the state are hurting. Tell us about why and some of the issues that you're up against right now. Yeah, there are there are really three three buckets um, as we come out of COVID. Um, and first, let me just say how, how uh, much of an honor it is here to be with you and uh, also, uh, how lucky we are in Nebraska to have Dr. Gold and uh, the institution that he runs at the University of Nebraska Medical Center. But um, there really are three issues. Uh, first, uh, and the biggest driver uh, of it all is workforce. Um, we lost a lot of healthcare uh, workers during COVID. Uh, first time nurses uh, deciding that this might not be the career for them. Uh, we lost uh, people at the end of their career saying, I'm worried about my health or the health of a loved one. Loved one. Uh, we are down uh, short, uh, well over 5,000 nurses uh, here in Nebraska, but it extends even beyond that to uh, all sorts of uh, support professionals uh, and, and other folks who are needed to keep hospitals operating. Uh, so that workforce shortage is, is driving two other issues. Uh, one of them is financial. Uh, anywhere from 50 to 60 percent of a, of a hospital budget uh, is used to pay our, our health care workers and support workers. And um, when when we don't have enough of them, uh, it, it costs more to get those that are available. Uh, and we have to limit uh, the services that we can provide when we just don't have the bodies uh, to do it. Um, and then the, the third issue also driven by workforce is post-acute placement, getting patients out of our hospital when they're ready to get out of our hospital. We started doing a survey in Nebraska about six months ago. And at any given time right now, we have almost 300 patients sitting in a hospital bed unnecessarily, uh, and we can't get a placement for them. And many of them need just nursing home care, skilled nursing care. Some have behavioral health issues and need uh, behavioral health placement. Uh, but all of those are creating a significant backlog in our hospitals, um, you know, putting a strain on the staff that we do have. Um, so all three of those issues coming together is creating a very challenging time for hospitals in Nebraska and really across the country. Mm. So we've got a backlog. That's what you're seeing right now. And you know going down the pike we're going to run into more problems. What does that mean for the future of rural health care? Obviously, you know, living in Nebraska, rural residents have a really difficult time just getting access to the health care that they need. Some have to drive one to two hours just to see a doctor. What does this mean for the future of rural health care and health care across the country as you see it? Yeah, well, certainly in the short term, the financial challenges are so significant that we can't take our eye off that. Um, a hospital, you know, given given uh, the hospital, anywhere from 60 to 80 percent of the revenue that they bring in is from a government payer, Medicare or Medicaid. Uh, and those rates are set either by CMS. Uh, sometimes Congress gets involved and adjusts them upwards or downwards a little bit. And at the state, they're set by the state legislatures usually. And while hospital costs over the last three years have gone up 26 percent, um, we've seen from Medicare and Medicaid a two or a three percent increase each year. Well, that's creating a, a significant financial strain on our hospitals because uh, the payments aren't keeping up with costs. Um, so hospitals, unfortunately, are looking to eliminate services to make ends meet. We've seen a couple hospitals in Nebraska close labor and delivery services. We've seen six hospitals in the last year close nursing, home, uh, nursing homes that they operated. Many other services, hospice, home health, um, orthopedic care is being restricted. So the financial crisis right now needs to be addressed or we're going to continue to lose services in rural areas. Um, but longer term, we've got to invest and grow our own workforce. I know Dr. Gold and UNMC are doing a wonderful job of that here, um, but we've got to grow people and keep them here. In Nebraska, unfortunately, we lose a lot of people, uh, bachelor trained, uh, bachelor degree uh, 
folks uh, to out-of-state out-migration of that population is a significant problem. So we've got to uh, grow our own healthcare workers and, and keep them here um, to be able to make sure we can serve um, uh, citizens in rural Nebraska and in rural America. Absolutely. That retention is so important. But obviously we are seeing a gap because Dr. Gold and his team are working so hard to raise up this next generation of, of healthcare providers who will likely stay in their rural hometowns. He's incentivizing that for them. But but we see this backlog now. What's going to happen in the interim? You talk about 5,000 nurses short in Nebraska. I think about all the rural communities being impacted by that. So this is serious. This is something that we're going to stay on top of. Brenda joins us from Nevada tonight. Thanks for joining us, Brenda. Thank you so much for your patience. Go right ahead. Brenda, are you with us? Okay, I think we lost Brenda. In the meantime, as we try to get her back on the line or get to our next caller, we've seen one of the issues facing Nebraska hospitals is a difficulty in placing patients in post-acute care. You talked a little bit about that. Yeah. What's happening in other states? How are they approaching the same problem, and, and where can we find solutions? Yeah, so the, the problem, uh, and I, I hear from my counterparts uh, that, that run hospital associations around the country, um, it, it unfortunately also comes down to the workforce issue in the nursing homes, the skilled nursing uh, units aren't appropriately staffed. They, they just can't take on more patients. Um, so we're working uh, with our legislature, um, trying to make sure that that we, we fund those entities appropriately uh, as well, um, especially nursing homes that, you know, they, they don't they don't have a whole team of nurses. They have you know, usually a nursing director or two on staff and then rely on LPNs and CNAs. And those are programs where individuals can go through and train um, in a three month period or for LPNs, it's a year or less. Um, we've got to find innovative ways to get um, people into those professions and, and incentivize them. But unfortunately, the, the labor market is, is really tough right now and, and CNAs and LPNs are not easy jobs. Um, and uh, they're competing with you know, uh, minimum wage jobs all around uh, all around the economy, trying to get people into those those professions. So um, we've been, again, working in the legislature on a few programs to incentivize people, make the cost of that education is, is almost, you know, to the point of being free uh, to in, uh, get people in and, and get them working in those facilities. Because really, if we don't have the bodies, we're just not going to be able to provide the care. Ah, that is so tough to hear. I mean, you think about the rural doctor. He's a big shot in town. Everybody knows the doctor in a rural community. It's usually one of the most upstanding citizens. It's You would want that role, I would think. It's interesting to me how people are leaving rural communities to go to the big cities. Dr. Gold, address this for us, if you will. What are some of the ways that you are working with your students? How are you incentivizing them to stay local? Sure. Well, we've done a whole uh, number of programs in those areas, but, you know, it's a pretty simple equation, Christina. If you take young women and young men who grow up in rural communities, their families are in rural communities, you educate them in a rural community, you make sure they have their clinical experiences in local facilities, hospitals, clinics, ambulatory care settings, etc., in a rural community, that's the highest chance that they'll settle there. You know, the, in healthcare, we have what we call the 50 50 rule, which isn't always exactly accurate. But what it says is that a healthcare professional typically will settle, 50% of them, one out of two, will settle within 50 miles of where they finish their education. And this seems to hold true for nurses and doctors and pharmacists, dentists, therapists, uh, et cetera. And so, again, what we're doing is just increasing the number of educational opportunities in rural parts of the state. Uh, and our experience has actually been better than 50-50. Indeed, since we first opened uh, an extensive program in uh, central Nebraska, 85% of the graduates of that program uh, have chosen to stay in a rural setting. You know, that's uh, more than 8 out of 10. Uh, and that's really impressive, which is one of the reasons we've partnered with the state of Nebraska to more than double uh, the number of educational opportunities in rural Nebraska in the hopes of uh, increasing uh, that workforce. And I know other states across the country have done this as well, but this is a true partnership uh, between the university system 
uh, and the state, the legislature, the governor, etc., uh, at a, you know, I don't want to say it's a crisis level situation, but if we don't do something to uh, intervene very quickly, it will become a crisis level situation in the future. Wow. Wow. Okay. Especially for rural America, as we often see, they get the worst of it when it comes to American medicine. We know that. We know that's just absolutely the case, especially when it comes to rural hospital closures and what we've seen and what we could see down the line. So we will stay on top of this for you. Now, it sounds like we got Brenda from Nevada back. Let's find out. Brenda, thanks for joining us. Are you with us? Yes, I am. Thank you. Go right ahead with your question. Okay. Um, I had read an article about a medical study on COVID-19 and vitamin D. Uh, that article also did promote the vaccines and boosters. But with the vitamin D, it said more than 80% of the people hospitalized with COVID had low levels of vitamin D and that low levels of vitamin D may make people more susceptible to the virus. It said vitamin D plays a role in minimizing the risk of respiratory infections and reduces the potential for blood clots. It also said the best source of vitamin D is from fatty fish, fortified dairy products, and also sunlight. Have you heard or do you know if more research has been done on vitamin D and COVID? Well, Brenda, first of all, thank you for calling. And uh, everything that you've just said has been reported uh, in the scientific literature, some of it in very small anecdotal studies, but some of it in larger studies uh, as well. Uh, unfortunately, a very large percentage of the population is vitamin D deficient, particularly during the winter months when people spend more and more time indoors and not outdoors. What gives you a uh, functional uh, levels of vitamin D are the combination of what you eat and the foods that you mentioned, uh, particularly also some of the dairy uh, foods, milk, cheese, uh, yogurt, uh, etc., uh, and also the ability uh, to have sunlight exposure, which done in a safe way uh, will to prevent sunburning and all the risks of skin cancer we've talked about. Uh, tends to convert our vitamin D levels uh, into uh, the active forms of vitamin D. And those active forms of vitamin D are very important to our bones, to our vision, uh, to almost every organ system, and certainly to our immune system. And so, absolutely so. Uh, good levels of vitamin D, which can be supplemented through an oral tablet, or better yet, through a balanced diet, complemented by an appropriate amount of sunlight, is a really good way uh, to stay healthy. Uh, to answer your question, yep, absolutely. Uh, there is some uh, very compelling data that says many of those individuals who are most seriously ill with COVID also have vitamin D deficiencies. But they may have multiple vitamin deficiencies. Many of them are malnourished due to older age or other medical conditions or have conditions that block absorption of the vitamins. So it's sometimes hard to know, Brenda, what's cause and what's effect. But overall, if you had a choice and have normal and uh, safe and effective levels of vitamin D, uh, that's always a good thing. Uh, put it on the forefront of our minds tonight. Thank you for that, Brenda. We appreciate it. Bill from Pennsylvania joins us now. Thanks for joining us, Bill. Go right ahead. Yeah, hello? Hey, Bill. Go right ahead yeah. with your question. Yeah, yeah. All right. Uh, I, I guess I'm listening on my phone. But first of all, what I want to say is, Dr. Gold, uh, don't get old, because I was on last week, and I, uh, I had it on the speakerphone, and, and then I didn't have it on my, uh, my talk phone. And so I, I really don't understand how this stuff works, but I want to say this. We live, in a, we live in a retirement community here from Pennsylvania near Gettysburg, and we do, we do love this uh, program. But I think this is a more educational than listening to the fake news. I, like I said before, I spoke to you before, and I'm a retired auctioneer, and I do have the gift of gab. But what I what I want to say tonight is this: uh, I, uh, I'm 80 years old, and so it's my wife, and we're pretty good shape for the shape that we're in at 80 years old, living here. We're one of the largest retirement communities in the United States, really, here close to Gettysburg, Pennsylvania. However, 
uh, 40 years ago, I almost lost my life with an infection called aspergillus. I don't know if I can say that correctly or not, aspergillii. And I don't want to go into the many, all the minute details it? that I want with my with my doctors and all that, but I was hospitalized, and they said a couple more days I would have died. My, I, I guess I'm going to be pretty candid and pretty frank here. My my mucus was as green as grass, and ultimately they had to operate on me and my my sinuses. And they said if this would have went to my brain a couple more days, I, w- I would have died. So I don't know if that is that aspergillus. Uh, well, however you pronounce it, is that still with us today? Is that a bacteria? Is that something similar to COVID? My wife and I are fully boosted, and we appreciate this show so much. Thank you for what you do. Thank you. Well, thank you for your kind words, Bill, and thanks for uh, being such a loyal viewer. Uh, Aspergillus uh, <clears throat> is a fungus, uh, and it is uh, very commonly uh, seen as a bread mold type of fungus. Uh, And unfortunately, it can infect our sinuses and it can get beyond our sinuses into our lungs, into our lymph nodes. uh, And unfortunately, uh, as uh, you were commenting on, it can get into your brain and it is extremely hard to treat when it becomes invasive. Fortunately, folks that have a normal immune system, uh, we can treat it with very good and very effective antifungal agents, different types of antibiotics today uh, with a very high degree of success. However, uh, it's in individuals with weakened immune systems, such as those that are being treated for cancer, those that have uh, solid organ uh, or bone marrow transplants, uh, those with other weakened immune systems or on medications that block your immune function, that make uh, uh, drugs, that make uh, uh, agents such as aspergillus and mucor and other types of fungal infections uh, so concerning. Uh, you're very fortunate that you recovered uh, fully, and I'm, I'm glad to hear that. And I'm glad to hear uh, that you and your wife are doing well. Yeah, what a great story, and, and what a blessing that you're still with us. Thank you so much for that call tonight. We still have time for your call, and we'd love to hear from you. 877-731-6733. We've got a few more moments. We want to hear from you tonight. More Rural Health Matters right after this. Stay with us. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We're going to go to the phones in just a moment. Want to make sure you have the number to call in, 877-731-6733. But before we go back to the phones, I want to bring in our special guest one more time because he has quite an interesting background. And I want to find out a little bit more about how working in politics has helped you, Jeremy Nordquist, with your new position with the Nebraska Hospital Association. Has it helped you as much as it as you thought it would when you took the job? How about that? Well, yeah. Well, uh, certainly there's there's plenty of, uh, of politics in healthcare, <laughs> but um, you know a big part of our focus here at the, the Hospital Association um, is representing the voice of our hospitals to policymakers. Healthcare is in, incredibly complex, and um, trying to break down those issues for um, people who are serving in office and explaining how the decisions they make to invest in health care workforce, uh, to pay hospitals, you know, um, certain provider rates, how that all impacts the care that the patients receive at the end of the day in our communities um, around the state. Um, so, uh, you know, it's, it's certainly part of that uh, persuasion that we, we do. And we, we really care about having strong hospitals um, from border to border in our state and making sure that Nebraskans, wherever they live, can can get to the health care that they need. That's noble work that you're doing, that's for sure. I, I will ask you, a little birdie told me you took this big job on in the middle of the pandemic, right? In the middle of the pandemic. What was that like? And was it trial by fire? Do you feel like you hit the ground running? Was there a learning curve? What was that like for you? Well, um, when I, I talked to our health care uh, leaders today, they, you know, whether they've been in the field 30, 40 years, they'll say, this is the, the worst it's ever been. And I've been been at this job a little over a year and they, well, I don't know any different. <laughs> so uh, hopefully it's it's all uphill from here, but um, uh, we're, we're working through it. The best part is the incredibly uplifting uh, people that we have working in healthcare in Nebraska. They're all uh, in it for the right reasons. They're, they care about their neighbors. Um, and and that, that's the best part is to engage with those folks. You know, leadership is, is 
key to what you're talking about. And Dr. Gold sets such a great example for the entire state, and not just for the entire state, for the entire country. Dr. Gold, talk about the relationship that you actually have at UNMC with the Nebraska Hospital Association, how you work together. Well, we're partners, uh, and, you know, we've actually worked with uh, Mr. Norquist going back to his time that he was uh, in the legislature and partnered on several things that would increase uh, our ability to help create a better, stronger health professions workforce uh, into the future. You know, at the end of the day, uh, we, our mission is to create uh, a healthier uh, community, uh, that we serve across the entire state and the region as an exemplar for other states and actually other parts of the world. And so having a partnership with the Hospital Association, having a partnership with the State Medical Association, and of course having very effective partnerships with the Governor's Office and with um, many, if not almost all, of our state legislators and our federal legislators is really critically important. And having people uh, like Mr. Norquist in place uh, is really a privilege to be able to just pick up the phone and say, what do you think about this? Or how can we help you? How can you help us? Uh, you know, and one of the things the Hospital Association does so well is help educate uh, the people who make decisions about payment rates, who pass laws and rules uh, that affect health care uh, in our state. And uh, therefore, having somebody as knowledgeable as uh, Mr. Norquist is critically important. And his knowledge started when he was young. Tell us about how growing up in a rural area <laughs> yourself, I mean, I feel like I buried the lead just bringing this up at this point, but you grew up in rural America. And that's yeah. so important. You really know what it's like, the hardships that rural Americans are up against. Talk about how that informs the issues that you deal with every day. Yeah, absolutely. I grew up in a town of 2,000 people in, in rural South Dakota. And, um, you know, we're, we weren't, you know, um, hours away from healthcare, but we were, were certainly 40, 50 miles to the nearest hospitals. And, um, you know, I've had family members, um, family friends who have, have seen the, you know, experienced the adverse uh, outcomes when you have to travel that distance uh, to get life-saving care in an emergency. So uh, those stories, um, you know, stick with me. And part of the reason I'm so passionate here in Nebraska and when I work with uh, groups outside the state to, to make sure that we have um, as much rural health care access as we can and try to keep it as strong as we can because it it impacts it impacts people. Absolutely. I mean, you think about Nebraska, the cattle production, all the crops that are grown across that state and how dangerous agriculture is yeah. in general. And so what you're doing is you're helping the farmers who feed the world. Yeah. Dr. Gold, we're just about out of time. I wanted to give you an opportunity, though, to share your final thoughts with our viewers tonight. Uh, just, of course, to thank everybody and again, uh, extend our very best wishes, our thoughts and prayers uh, to the families of those uh, that lost their lives uh, in the recent shooting event uh, in Nashville. Uh, this is such a hard time for so many different reasons, and all those types of events just continue to punctuate that these are serious challenges uh, in our communities, and we need to address them uh, head on. We're very grateful for the opportunity to continually do that. Absolutely. As a mother of a toddler here in Nashville, my heart was stopped for a short time today. And so you're absolutely right, especially when it hits so close to home. Mr. Nordquist, do you have any final thoughts for our viewers tonight? Well, I um, just uh, appreciate the time to, to talk about what's happening uh, in our, our health care system. It really is happening across the country. And, uh, you know, always, always uh, hopeful that other folks will engage their voices in this calls and emails to your elected officials about the importance of rural health care make a difference. Absolutely. Our health is our wealth. And we will be here for you every Monday night on Rural Health Matters. I want to thank you both so much for joining us tonight. You at home as well. Now, if you didn't get a chance to ask your question, you can actually leave us a voice recording, 855-776-6147. And we'll make sure we get your call answered next week. Thanks for joining us.